now, and um, he came from IBM. In 1969, the year of the moon landing, um, uh, IBM software and hardware powered the um, shuttles. Um, there was a big team that worked at NASA at the time, um, working long hours and making sure that systems didn't fail. In 1972, the magnetic stripe, uh, stripe technology enabled the first modern networked IBM, um, uh, ATM. Before this, there were ATMs, but they weren't networked. They belonged only to one premises, and all your transactions were recorded and applied to your account the next day. So this was all networked. You can use your Stripe card um, at any ATM, and the transaction was instantaneous. Then in 1975, a, uh, an IBM researcher named Mendelbosch uh, coined the term fractal for his, for his new research. Uh, into recursion and geometry. Um, 1981, the technology was developed for laser eye surgery, uh, which, which we still use today. You know, it's, it's very popular. Then this is one of my favorites. In 1981, uh, IBM developed the scanning tunnel microscope. That image you see is IBM uh, written in atoms. So this enabled um, people in physics to, to, to surface uh, images on a, at an atomic level. Um, the developer of the system won the Nobel Prize for Physics a few years later in 1986. Then, of course, maybe you heard about Deep Blue. This was the latest in um, IBM's research. In 1996, they developed a computer to play the world champion at the time, Garry Kasparov. They played two six-game matches uh, in 1996. Um, Deep Blue won one and drew two from six games. In 1997, at the rematch, uh, Deep Blue won two games and drew three. And if you average all those scores out, it, it meant that Deep Blue um, beat the reigning world champion. Um, Gary Kasparov asked for a rematch after this, but there's also some controversy about, about he, didn't, he didn't get it, and IBM soon dismantled uh, Deep Blue. Um, so who knows what happened there. Okay, so moving on to the next, the next grand challenge. Deep Blue was the first grand challenge. And IBM Watson was the next grand challenge. So in 2001, um, Watson was developed to compete on a US quiz show called Jeopardy. So in Jeopardy, users are asked complicated um, questions over a broad domain, and the task is to identify the answer and buzz in before the other contestants get a chance to answer. And the faster you buzz in with the right answer, the more points you get. Um, so with Jeopardy, there's a whole bunch of round robin um, challenges where people play, and then they have to beat, um, they have to win uh, tournaments, and at the end, there's a final. So Watson started in the first level and beat a lot of people to learn and get to the final. This picture here is from the final, and these two human players are previous uh, Jeopardy um, champions, so they've won this competition uh, many times in the past. And as you can see, Watson is competing here and winning. Um, and you'll see, if you watch the clip on YouTube, there's a link at the end of the talk, um, you'll see Watson wins by a comfortable margin. So the, the Jeopardy challenge was a compelling and notable way to measure the technology of question answering systems. What are the properties of question answering systems? Well, we have to, um, it has to be able to search over a broad and open domain uh, where the language is uh, complex. Um, for example, here are two, two questions from Jeopardy. See if you can find the answer yourself and you'll see the right at the end. The first question is, um, the first person mentioned by name in The Man in the Iron Mask um, is the hero of a previous book by the same author. The second question, it's got, uh, it's worth $2,000, it's more complicated. And notice it's also got two parts to it. So a system has got to do two things here. The first part is 
of the four countries in the world that does not have, uh, does not have um, this map equation with the US, which one is the furthest north? So there's, there's, th there's two parts here. So in this case, Watson has got to understand these questions in natural language. It has to return the top three answers with some confidence. If the confidence, I should mention, the confidence here is that green bar at the bottom. If Watson is not sure about an answer, you see the confidence will go low. And if the highest confidence is not meeting some threshold, say 50%, then Watson doesn't attempt to answer the question. He just says, I don't know, and uh, he doesn't buzz in. If the confidence is past the threshold, then IBM, then Watson buzzes in. So here we have from a question answering system. Use it just to find John's address at keywords. For example, John and address. A search engine today won't usually find the top document which actually has the information that you need because there's no keyword of address in it. That address you see is semantic information that's implicit in the document. Um, it's not explicit. What about structured and unstructured data? Structured data is in some sort of table with metadata. For example, if the query is Welsh, when this, it takes some knowledge, some background knowledge to know that this table has people and the organization compared to some unstructured data where there's no metadata, all you have is some raw text. Search engines usually will find the second case if keywords match, but in this case, if you look at, uh, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved him a master painter. There's no obvious keywords in this case for organization. Master painter, tenor, those are all semantics uh, that the system has, um, has to know about somehow. Um, and also if, if you do a traditional search, you might, you might get the put in red, uh, Welsh, JE, but what about the metadata, the semantics around it? A system has to know all this information to respond um, properly. So let's just talk a bit, a, bit a bit about the challenges in creating a competitive um, QA system. So th this was um, the Jeopardy team, this was their, their way of measuring how well the system performed. Um, on the x-axis you have um, how confident the user's answer is, and on the y-axis you have how many um, questions they would answer. So these dots in the middle are what the Jeopardy researchers call the winner's cloud. It means all um, humans that were able to answer questions really well, how they performed in terms of how accurate their answers were and how often they would answer. And you see that the red dots are previous champions. So top means that the answers are really accurate and further along on the x-axis means they would get more questions right as well. When um, the Jeopardy team first started in 2007, their QA system was the brown line at the bottom. And you can, you can see up here, the best confidence they had was with a few questions. And the more questions the system tried to answer, the less accurate the answers were. So they had a major challenge to get their system performing up around the Windows Cloud. And as you can see, it took a few iterations. Um, they made incremental progress over four years. They started in 2006 and 2007 um, with training, with developing, the system was able to more accurately answer more questions. And you'll see the last version in 2010, the dark blue line. It's almost, it's almost as good as the top human players. But this was a, was a, so, a slow, steady climb. But in the end, um, they got to human level performance. 
Right, so let's talk a bit about how Watson works. Watson is deployed in the real world at the moment, as we'll see in a few slides. And the same system that underpins today's Watson in the real world and the Jeffrey system is the same. So this is Watson in its present state. This is an overview of DeepQA. DeepQA is a massively parallel probabilistic evidence-based architecture. It's, it's how Watson answers a question. So we'll start, we'll start with a question. First, we have some question analysis. Here we, we look at the question in detail. We do a detailed parse to try and understand as much as possible about the question. Then we try to find our answers, hypothesis generation. Here we search over a large corpus, um, millions of documents to, to try and find the document or the passage containing our answer. From all these documents and passages, we try and build our answer, build our hypothesis. Um, and we, here's where we build our, um, our evidence structure as well. Once we have our answer, or we have a whole bunch of candidate answers, I should say, now it's time to find the confidence of the answer, to say answer one is good, answer two is not so good, answer three is really bad. We use machine learning, a lot of machine learning in this case, which is the area that I work in mainly, um, to try and find a good model to say good answer, bad answer. And at the end, we return um, one answer with one confidence or three answers with uh, three confidences. And when I say parallel, I mean that this can be distributed. This is a lot of processing, and you need to be able to distribute it across different machines. Here you have things like decomposing the question into two parts and then carrying out each pipeline separately, and at the end, bringing it all together. So in that first question we saw about of the four US countries, uh, of the four countries US does not have diplomatic relations with, which is the most north. Here, one pipeline will be um, those countries that the United States does not have diplomatic relations with. The other pipeline, in parallel, will be uh, countries that are north, say, of the US. And at the end, we bring those together uh, to try and merge into one. Now, just to give you an idea of the computation involved, if we have, if we have a question here, we have multiple parts of the question, so this is where we um, split. If we have, if we're searching over our corpus here, we can have hundreds of answers, uh, hundreds of documents and hundreds of passages where the answer could be in. And in each of these documents or passage, uh, passages, we could have hundreds more answers. And of all the, of the hundred more answers, each one has got evidence, each one has got um, sources. So this, this um, uh, architecture is, is meant to, to, to be distributed for this incredible um, uh, processing requirement. So let's just step through a bit of the pipeline, um, step by step, just to give you a better idea of what is going on at each stage. So here's, here's a clue. Um, here's a question. In, 19, in 1894, Mr. Post created his warm cereal drink in this Michigan city. So we're looking for a city in Michigan. Michigan is a US state, so we're trying to find which city uh, this happened in. So we start with question analysis. So in question analysis, we do a deep parse uh, of our question. Um, we do a deep parse to find things like the subject, the verb, the object, the predicates, the named entities. Um, we want to know if there's, a, if there's a city mentioned in our query or a, a time or a date. We try and learn as much as we can about the sentence. Um, Two important things to mention here, the idea of a focus that helps, helps Watson score its answers at the end. The focus is the part of the question that you can replace, substitute with the answer to make the question a valid statement. 
So if you replace here this Michigan city with the answer, that's, that statement should be a valid statement. Uh, similar with the let. The let is a lexical answer type. It helps us, it helps us at the end to correlate answers and um, evidence. So here we're looking for the answer type is a city. What kind of city? A Michigan city. So we need to find as much of these properties, um, even, even uh, keywords, for example, to do our search. So once we have all our properties, here we have lat, focus, keywords, named entities, um, part of speech, all this. Now we can go and do our primary search where we find our documents and passages that might contain the answer. So in this case, we've distilled a query down to some keywords, and we fire these off to our knowledge bases. In the Jeopardy system, the knowledge bases were all of Wikipedia, all of Factbook, all of IMDB, all structured knowledge, um, knowledge bases form the corpus. In commercial uh, offerings, sometimes you'll see it can be uh, open domain corpuses like Wikipedia, but it can also be closed domain. For example, a company's um, product information or FAQs. It can be any, any corpus that you want the system to search over. In this case, we fire a query um, off to our corpuses and we get document hits. And within the document, we get passage hits. So parts of the document that might contain the answer. So now we have, uh, after primary search, we have some potential do uh, documents that contain the answer. We need now to extract the potential candidates, the hypothesis, from these documents. So here is where the system tries to read and understand the documents to, to find specific answers. So just say you have a whole the document from Wikipedia on foods. This will mention different kinds of foods. Uh, this will mention cereals, fast foods, whatever. We need to go through this, pass this, in a way to, to find um, to find canon answers that make sense. So in this case, it's, it's a huge uh, generate and test uh, system. We look at things like uh, named entities and document links, um, which, are usually, which usually mean entities um, to form our hypotheses. And from each of these as well, we can extract uh, some metadata, some information about the document, like how well was it ranked in the first place. Now, this is, since this is where, docu where Watson does all its reading, it's good to mention here how Watson reads. So in this case, we have, we have volumes of text. When we do a parse, we can, we can learn things about the sentence in terms of subject, verb, object. So, so we know what part of the sentence is subject, what's the object, and what uh, is the action. And if we do, th if we do this over a large uh, corpus, we can make some generalizations um, about what words mean. For example, we can, we can learn that inventors usually patent inventions. So, Patent is a verb connecting uh, inventors and inventions. Or we can learn that officials submit resignations, or people earn degrees at schools. All these are um, related. Um, and we can use the frequency of these to make generalizations. So we can say that it's more f the word, the sentence vessel sinks. Sink is more likely to be associated with vessel, then people sink eight balls in a pool context because it occurs more frequently. So we can, we can make generalizations based on frequency in the corpus. So once we've generated some answers, it's time to do some hypothesis scoring. So this means 
taking our evidence and saying, how well does my generated answer match the evidence? Um, I mentioned before lexical answer type and focus. Here's where we do our correlations. Does this candidate answer, does it, is it of the same type as our required type? If we substitute our answer in the sentence, in the focus, will the sentence make sense? This is where we do all this text matching. So here, um, this is a good example of a, a geospatial relation. The fact that the answer must be in a city spatially located in the state of Michigan. This, similarly, this could be a date. So you'd have to have some idea of the date and the time and things that happened around this time as well. So this is where we kind of relate all these, all these extra information on the side to what our candidate answers are doing. Um, just as an indication, Watson usually has about three or 400 of these features where it tries to um, give a numeric value to different properties. And it uses all these 400 features in the machine learning, which we'll see soon. And here's where we do our passage scoring as well. A similar thing to where we score our candidate answers. Here we score the candidate answers in the context of the passage it came from. So if we have, for example, Battle Creek, our Michigan city, if it occurs in these two documents, and these documents contain some text that was also in the question, it means that that, that passage is highly correlated with the answer, uh, sorry, with the question. So the answer must be highly correlated with the question. If this document contained uh, keywords and um, other mentions that weren't in the question, maybe the document isn't so related uh, to, to the question, and so the answer isn't so strong. So here's where we build the evidence for our answers. Maybe the more documents that an answer um, had, the more strong it is. Maybe the, maybe the, in some cases, maybe you want fewer documents. These all, these, these all form the evidence. So once we have our evidence and our answers, we can go on to the final stage, which is answer merging and confidence estimation. So here is where we have a whole bunch of candidate answers and a whole bunch of features and we use machine learning models to try and um, make sense of these features. In, in a manual case, you could say, OK, so if a document has a high rank uh, and say this feature is high, then we, we want to consider that the answer is a good answer. But because there's so many uh, features, it's really hard to do this manually. This is why we have to have machine learning, because we have hundreds of thousands of um, answers, 400, 500 features. It's a lot of data, if you imagine that, that um, matrix, to be able to reason over. Um, the Jeopardy system uses, I don't know if there are machine learning experts in the room, the Jeopardy system uses log logistic regression um, models in a cascade where you have a model, it takes some input, takes some output, that plugs into another model, take some input, take some output, and we have a string of models. And at the end, each answer, um, there's a signal where the top answers kind of float to the top and the bad answers float to the bottom. And at the end, you have a nice confidence based on all those features. Um, so this is where I would spend most of my time. If we have a new deployment, for example, the machine learning models have got to be trained on the data. The Jeopardy system, every, every round that wasn't the final was a learning curve. So you had answers, you had questions. All those were incorporated into the system after every match. Models were retrained to get, to get better and better. This is how we saw the incremental improvements. Um, So at the end, we have uh, the answers with the confidence. And this, rep this, represents the system's, um, 
This, way, this is a measure of how good the answer is from the system. So that, that's, that's the Watson um, overview. It's, it's, it's the, the algorithm that the Jeopardy system and current deployments use. So now I'll just talk a bit about what's in the real world and, and how that contrasts to the, the Jeopardy system. So as we mentioned, Watson started out as a research project in 2006. It took four years of development to be able to compete um, in the Jeopardy competition. And that's when it really gained um, attention. And at that point, people were really interested in wanting it um, as their system. Um, so in 2011, Watson was deployed in um, the healthcare um, arena. A few hospitals and um, insurance um, companies in the States use Watson. And that was going quite well. I've got a few examples of, of, of that later on. Um, then the next year, Watson was used in the financial services, for example, in customer care uh, applications and in um, wealth management. Um, and now Watson is making its rounds uh, in the multilingual world as well. So this is the team I'm working on. And we're actively developing Watson for Spanish, German, Brazilian Portuguese, uh, and uh, Japanese. So you may, be, you may be curious about why these languages? These depend on the business interests. So if the clients um, want to use Watson in a, in a, in a language, it, it'll depend on um, the client's language. So at the moment, Spanish is very popular because in South America, there's a big demand. Um, and same for uh, Japanese. We have a lot of Japanese clients who want to use the system. So just I'll talk a bit about the healthcare deployment because this is a really interesting um, real life application. So medicine has become very complex. Here it says that only 20% of um, knowledge is used uh, today by uh, clinicians. It means that there's a lot of research out there. Um, this says medical info is doubling every five years. Um, people, uh, doctors and clinicians don't have time to go over all the research when making their um, cases because there's so much research. Um, and it also says that a lot of errors in the way medication is prescribed because uh, new research comes out, it shows that some drug has bad side effects. Um, doctors don't often keep up to date with all this because of their incredibly high workloads. So what to do? This is, this is a great picture. It shows the number of um, articles and the number of medical articles um, published from 1952 to 2012. And you see, it's just the number of articles, the number of research out there is just, it's just going up and up and up. It means doctors and clinicians have got to try to keep up with all this research if they want to make the most informed um, diagnosis and treatment for their patients. And it's a lot, it's a lot to demand, um, especially if they already ha um, have a lot of patients and they're busy. So this is where Watson can, can, can help them. And it's a, it's a similar thing, it's a similar situation in the financial services where there's a lot of information in the market. For example, um, Reuters uh, publishes the equivalent of 9,000 pages of financial news um, every day. If you're in, in the financial services or if you are advising people on how to invest or in the stock market, that's a lot of information to try and, try and digest, try and read every day um, to keep on top of things. Um, in terms of productivity, it means you're spending a lot of your time doing your own research, keeping up to date with the latest. Um, it'd be great if there was a system that could do all this for you, read all this information, um, and maybe you can just uh, query this uh, system t to reduce your, your time to do all this research. So if we want to use Watson in these, in the medical or the financial services, there's a different set of challenges. 
compared to the Jeopardy system. For example, in the Jeopardy system, there was one user. This was the quiz master who was answering the question. Um, whereas if Watson's deployed in the real world, in the medical industry or in the financial service industry, there are tens of thousands of users um, asking questions to the system at the same time. Um, in the Jeopardy system, there was only one question being asked at the time. So the input was one question. Um, Watson was trained offline to, uh, to um, pass like Wikipedia and things. But when you're looking at Watson in the real world, the, the data, the corpus changes all the time. We're talking about how new articles are published and how financial news uh, changes on a daily basis. All this has got to be ingested, loaded into the system. So the input um, can change every time. For example, you get a new patient and um, their medical records are going to be scanned and loaded so Watson can make a decision. Or there's a new research article published. All that's going to be loaded dynamically, um, whereas the Jeopardy system was a once-off. Um, in Jeopardy, also, the input was um, perfectly formed sentences, whereas in the real world, you have um, noisy text. For example, people make mistakes when they type the question or they use shorthand and ab abbreviations. The system has got to realize what an abbreviation is, um, maybe some sp spelling mistakes. Um, I mentioned the machine learning models. In the real world, um, you don't have time to retrain and take the system offline for days to learn your new models. Whereas in Jeopardy system, the competitions were weeks apart. So you had all this offline time What's now all this offline time to retrain, to retest. In the real world, that's not available. Um, in the Jeopardy system, we said there was evidence, but all we cared about was the answer and the confidence. If we got it right, great. If we didn't, fine. In, in, in the real world, we want to know the evidence. We want to be able to see how an answer, um, how the system found its answer, because the evidence is probably more important than the answer. For example, if you're doing some medical diagnosis, you want to know what steps you used to diagnose a patient. So the evidence is more important than the answer. Um, even security. With the Jeopardy system, it was an open model, um, no security. If Watson is being deployed in the real world, if you're handling financial information or patient information, there's a lot of security that you need. Um, so everything's got to be encrypted for example. And how does this impact um, hardware and performance? That picture you see is the hardware required for the Jeopardy system. It was the size of this stage. It, it had 3,000 um, cores, a few stands, huge fans to cool it. People um, had to go in there you know, with, those, with those white um, overalls because it was a sanitized environment. Um, what was that? 90 servers, 16 terabytes of RAM. So that was purpose built for one application. And that could only handle 20 questions a minute. And now people expect the same system, as powerful as Jeopardy, to run on their laptop. Um, so it has to be parallel and distributed and super optimized. For example, there's the healthcare system now runs on 64 cores, which is not much compared to 3,000. Um, one server is all you need. Normal um, 5, 12 gigs of RAM. And that has got to be able to process up to 50 questions a minute. So that's a lot to expect in only a few years in terms of hardware. What are some of the other challenges moving away from the Jeopardy system and into the real world? What about the kind of data used in the real world. Real world, in the real world, knowledge isn't encoded as neatly as it is in Wikipedia and IMDB and uh, a fact book. Knowledge is encoded in different ways and it's unstructured. So how does the system deal with all this unstructured data and all this encoding? Um, for example, we can have well-formed um, pros, 
for example, a nice XML document um, where everything is well formed and the tags tell you what the information is, or you can have just semi-structured data where we just have, like on top, we just have some information, some, some column headings. Um, how do we know what the column headings mean? Some data can be ambiguous. Um, this is, I think this is a police report where this is just typed up. There's no column headings, but there are some, there are some, in, there's, there's some encoding in terms of the first name, the address, the phone number, but it's not always clear. For example, we, we know that this is a phone number, but we don't know what, what this is. Is this, an, is this an area code? So there's some implicit encoding that is ambiguous. And it's also um, ungrammatical and domain specific. So this is an uh, intercept, say, from some uh, call tracking system where it's recording a dialogue. And here you see the language is, uh, is completely unstructured. People use acronyms, they use shorthand. If, you, if, this, if this dialogue contains useful information, um, how do, we, how do we make sense of it? Um, a good example is uh, thanks for shorthand. Um, if you look that up in the dictionary, I'm sure you won't find it, but we need to know what that means. And also, um, in the medical domain, there are lots of handwritten notes. Say that a nurse or a doctor are doing their rounds and they have, and they have a note um, pad. They're just going to scribble things down, and it's up to the machine when it's um, trying to scan this to make sense of it. The, uh, they might have spelling mistakes, like um, in patients over 60 years of age. Um, that makes no sense to a machine without um, knowing that it's a mistake and what could it probably be. So there's a lot of ways to handle data in the real world, and it's not clean. Now, in this case, Yes, the t technology exists to handle different kinds of data, but it's not integrated well. Um, so you need a whole bunch of different systems to try and stick them together uh, to make sense of something. And also, it's not scalable. It's not evolved. It's not a seamless operation. Um, so when we're dealing with real-world data, we have to think about all these different kinds of data and how to handle them in the same context, in the same system. So, so I mentioned I talk a bit about what's in for healthcare. When I say healthcare, I mean it's a clinical decision support system that aids doctors treat their patients. Doctors are still in charge. They just rely on Watson, say, to help them with the diagnosis or to confirm that what they think and what the system thinks matches up to ease their burden, not to replace them, because that would be very scary. So the first uh, healthcare system was in 2001, uh, sorry, 2011 at the Columbia University Hospital. And then uh, in the same year, WellPoint is a US insurer. They also use the same system. In 2012, it was adopted by another, um, another university hospital, the Cleveland Clinic. And in 2013, um, it was used to help um, cancer specialist treat oncology um, patients, so patients with cancer. And I've got a few screenshots here of the Watson for Healthcare system, just to give you an idea of, of what it does and how it works. So in this case, you have a patient, you have some information about the patient. Um, then you have some, some notes about, about the patient. Perhaps they came in and saw a doctor on separate occasions. Um, so you try and collect as much information about the patient as possible. The, this is Watson's view of the world in terms of this particular patient. And we see that this patient uh, needs some treatment. So Watson tries to, given her condition, Watson tries to build up some, some sort of treatment plan or it tries to schedule tests. Um, to get more information. For example, 
if the patient comes in and says, uh, and, she's, and she has cancer or she, has, she thinks she has cancer, she is sick in some way, Watson needs more information to make a diagnosis. So it will line up uh, tests and procedures to get more information. So the first test might tell us something we don't know. The second test might tell us something. For example, we do an MRI, that'll give us more information. We do an EKG, that'll give us more information. We just build up, um, we build up as much information as we can to make a diagnosis. And in each case, you'll see there's an evidence button. So this will tell, this will tell you why Watson recommended a particular test. Maybe there's some research that says, given our patient's uh, symptoms, if they also exhibit um, this, then their diagnosis could be uh, this. So we try to eliminate as much as possible. We try and get as much information as possible. And once we have all our information, we can um, suggest treatment plans. And also, like I said, there's, there's a confidence. So given some information, given some tests, uh, given some symptoms, we can say with some confidence, this is the diagnosis, uh, this is the kind of treatment uh, they should have, this is, we need more information, and we can match this with um, the patient's um, preferences. If the patient is okay, is willing to undergo an ECG, okay, we include that in our evidence. If the patient does not want an ECG, um, if the patient does not want to be scanned, uh, we can also include that in our evidence, and we can and we can um, have different options. Here's an example of um, a treatment plan. Um, if you look at the if you look at the evidence, so here we see here we see some some research articles that have been taken into account to help that decision. Um, has, uh, is this research that the doctor is aware of um, before he saw the patient? Maybe not. But now, maybe Watson has told him, okay, maybe this is relevant because it helped me. So the doctor can go and um, read this article and uh, see, if, see if this uh, evidence is relevant. If it's not, not relevant, he can, he can remove it from Watson's evidence list and this kind of forms a backward chain. So the system says, okay, I've been told that my evidence is wrong, so maybe I should recompute knowing that my evidence is, isn't 100% right. That's what the remove button does. But also, like you can see, this will highlight to a doctor what is relevant in terms of the plethora of research uh, for the patient. So the, the, uh, that was the um, healthcare plan. This is the Watson system for financial services where Watson is a virtual agent to do customer service, customer sales, support. Um, what are the domains for um, a virtual agent? The insurance um, market is a big place. Uh, telecommunications, um, the banking, financial uh, industry. Where here the um, questions are questions relating to a company's product manual or its FAQ or its research documentation. Where the system can either have um, users at the end can have a direct conversation with, with Watson about uh, some product manual say, or the company can employ um, a third party, for example a call center, where the call centers use Watson to find their answers uh, to help people. So it means that the employers um, know how to interact with the system. And all this is to improve client experience and to reduce um, calls to the uh, call center. These are some questions from a deployment for um, insurance, uh, USAA in the States, where people ask uh, questions like, when will I be able to retire? Or how much will it cost to send my daughter to school? If you think about these questions, 
Watson has got to be able to generalize. For example, when will I be able to retire? The I here is not referring to a person. It's referring to a, a category of people. So the answer that it finds has got to be very, um, quite uh, general. The same with how much would it cost to send my daughter to school? Um, my daughter, what do we, what we know about my daughter? It's, 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 it means that we're looking for um, something, about, something about all children, but not a particular child. It's got to make these generalizations. Um, this image here you see is from SoftBank. This is the newest Japanese Watson client where they plan to take Watson and use it as the brain in their, in their, in their robots. These robots are there for kind of customer service. Um, in SoftBank's um, offices. So if you have, if you have a query, you, you go to this robot, and it's like a kiosk, but you have to, you have to basically use like, like a, a keyboard to enter your query. With Watson in, in the brain, they'll just remove the keyboard, and you just ask your question. Um, so it's doing customer service, um, but from a, from a robot. So moving on to multilingual Watson now. I mentioned before that the Japanese system was English Pacific. It had a lot of English only components. For example, the parser. Um, that slide I showed you in question analysis where we decompose the uh, sentence to find out all the information that we need, that's what the parser does. So Watson uses, the, the, the Japanese system uses an English specific parser called ESG. This is a rule based parser, very good quality. For example, it'll tell you with, with really good confidence what parts of speech are in a sentence or subject, verb, object. It would, but it only works for English. Um, if you try and parse a French question with an English parser, the output is complete garbage, um, as you might expect. But also, the Jeopardy system used an English based type system. So if you asked a question about a person um, and the answer was a president, you had to know that the president was of a type leader and a leader is of a type uh, person. The same with, say, um, a car and a train. These are, of, um, these are types of transport. So there was, a, there was a complicated type system, but this was English only. Um, and also named entities. The Jeopardy system knew a lot about English named entities. It knew that US resolved to United States, or USA resolved to United States of America. These aren't um, applicable in other languages, uh, only English. So the multilingual team in Dublin, Ireland, our job was to make Watson language agnostic. By language agnostic, all the underlying components of the system, all the algorithms, should work irrespective of language. Here we just want to make it extensible easily to other languages. So there had to be a separation between the algorithms and the language. So the algorithms had to be uh, generic, they had to work on any language, where you just plug in a parser, say, or plug in a named entity recognizer, and you have a multilingual system. Uh, so where, where the English parser was used, we use a st statistical language parser. This means you have some data, and you can just use machine learning to train a parser. The more data you have to train, the better your parser will be. It's not rule-based, um, which is what the Jeopardy system was, um, but it's more generic. And unlike the Jeopardy system, if you have a multilingual statistical parser, you can have a universal part of speech set. So any, any language, once you train it, you get the same part of speech tags. Um, and you can use those part of speech tags um, in your different algorithms, um, like we saw before. Whereas the English parser, um, there was a specific part of speech set. To make any changes to the parser, you have to change each algorithm. And also, in terms of name entities, we need to be able to recognize name entities across different languages. Um, 
and not just across different languages, we need to recognize that the same entity is the same. So if you're talking about Lisbon, in English, in Portuguese, in Spanish, maybe they have different, maybe they have um, different spelling, but we need to know that all these refer to the same single concept. This helps when you're building like a knowledge graph um, in different languages, but it's all the same concepts. Now, I'll just give you a few examples of some of the challenges that we face uh, in our Dublin lab when it comes to multilingual Watson. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Tokenization as well, is, it's another particular nuance with multilingual Watson. Um, you, you see an example now where not all, not all languages have white space tokenization. You think, it's, you think it's simple to solve until you see a language where there's no white space tokenization. Character encodings, you think that if you use one generic set like Unicode, it'll work for all languages. Some languages don't have character encodings in Unicode, or it needs two-byte Unicode. Um, there's also cultural references that need to be taken into account um, when you're doing multilingual Watson. Here are some examples that, that, that we found. Even in English, um, the same rules don't apply. For example, in English, how does the alarm go off by going on? That sentence doesn't translate the same in other languages. Um, how can a house burn up as it burns down? These seem like different concepts. In English, it makes sense. In some languages, in other languages, it doesn't. Um, there's some Japanese text here. This is a paragraph, but there's no white space to help you recognize words. So how do you do tokenization? This is, this is a German word. Uh, it's a German compound word. So it can be split up. Different, the different meanings in the word are all joined together. So how do we make sense of this uh, in a generalized context? Um, even, even, in, even in English. This is English, but there are alphanumeric characters, there are non-word characters. Um, how do we handle this in the same system? This is what the Japanese text looks like if it does have white spaces. But how do we get a system to know that, OK, this is Japanese. Uh, we don't use white spaces. We use another form. It's a really, really tricky problem, and in German as well. If you're, trying, if you're trying to decompose this word into different meanings, how, how, do, you match, how do you match that um, without explicit knowledge in a generalized way? It's, it's a very hard problem to solve. So these are some of the, some of the problems we're facing in multilingual Watson. Um, now, so I suppose many of you are also interested in what kind of jobs that are going in IBM Watson. So this is the link, if you are interested. Um, like I mentioned before, the, the, main, the main focus of Watson work is in the USA. Um, the Watson system was built in Austin, Texas. This is where the big research department is. But there's also a new uh, office in, they, there's a new building uh, in Silicon Alley in New York. It's a dedicated Watson building. Uh, there's some offices in the UK, Israel, and of course Ireland, where Watson development is going on. If you are interested in uh, jobs, there are there are three main um, types of jobs. There's uh, professional, so that means you have some work experience. Uh, there's entry level, which means you're just out of um, college or university, and there's also lots of student and internships where you where you do a semester or um, during your holidays, uh, three or four months, those are, those are uh, job options as well. In terms of the kind of roles you can get, um, there's roles in the software group where you generally work as a software developer maintaining a Watson system that's being deployed, for example, a healthcare system or Watson for financial services. So it's a, it's a system that's, that's live where it was as you might expect, normal user problems where you have to post patches and uh, do upgrades, and it's more kind of software engineering. But there's also research jobs. 
like what we do in uh, Dublin, where we have clients, but we're also working on a research code base where we're trying out different parses, we're trying out different technologies to see which one is more viable. And that's, that's not so engineering, it's more research. We have, to, we have to publish our work, we have to back up our choices with research. That's, that's more research job. And of course, as well, the sales and marketing, um, if you like this sort of thing. Um, in terms of skills um, on the Watson team, Watson is developed in Java. Uh, if you have strong Java skills, um, there's, always, there's always job vacancy, so it's a good thing to keep checking. And Watson is developed in this uh, architecture called UEMA. This is an IBM architecture. If, if you know UEMA, that's always a big bonus. Um, first and foremost, to work in Watson, we're looking for natural language processing skills. Um, any uh, NLP skills are very important. This involves things like computational linguistics. Um, we have a lot of linguists on our team. If you have speak more than one language, also it's a big bonus. Um, another area is uh, advanced and semantic search. So this is where we saw Watson searching over it, its corpuses. For example, if you have experience with Solar or Lucene, that's very important. Um, machine learning. Um, machine learning is, finding machine learning experts is not easy. We are always on the lookout for machine learning experts. If you have knowledge of statistical machine learning methods, supervised, uh, semi-supervised reinforcement learning, uh, deep learning with neural networks, um, it's hard to find people with these skills. Uh, data mining, um, if you have an experience. Even knowledge representation and reasoning. So if you know but about ontologies or lexicons um, or how to extract um, knowledge from unstructured sources, these are the kind of skills that we're looking for in Watson. Right, so that, that is the talk. I hope, you, I hope it kept you interested. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Cheers. Yes. Good question. So the, the question was, we have a lot of uh, features uh, in Watson. I said 500 features. And the, the question was, why do we need them? And do we use words actually as, as features? The answer is no, we don't, we don't use words as features. All these features are properties. Um, there are different algorithms, say, that, that match an answer and evidence and the question. So things like, uh, textual alignment and uh, biograms and textual similarity. Um, it's, 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 it's different ways to capture how well an answer fits within some uh, passage text, which is the evidence. S why we have so many is that in some cases, some features are relevant and some are not. If you have a question that involves a date or a time. There might be some algorithms that work really well with dates and times, like, um, I forgot the word, like time lapse, you know, um, but those won't work on uh, pure text with no date and time. So in some cases, some inputs, um, some features won't, won't fire, and some features will fire. So the model needs to learn that in some cases, some features aren't, aren't relevant, some cases they are, um, and it's hard to know this beforehand.
Yes. That's a good question, though, talking about training data. For the Jeopardy system, there was a lot of training data. You could be selective on what you trained on because there were teams out there gathering questions, going to previous competitions, uh, questions, answers. So you had a lot of training data. You could be selective. You could do some feature analysis, feature reduction. In the real world, training data is hard to come by. So just say we have, uh, we're have looking at uh, uh, financial services where you have a new company who wants to use Watson. They have a corpus of documents. It's not very big. Maybe they have 200 questions, 200 questions from, from, uh, from their logs, say, you can use. So you have to try and find as much information that's useful in a small feature set because you can't pick and choose. For example, uh, SoftBank have said to us that they want their Japanese system ready for user trials, and they've given us a 1,000 questions. So we have to generalize Japanese models and things with 1,000 questions. So we use these with um, some feature selection algorithms to see which features are useful or not. But it's all, it all depends on what trading data we get and the context. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go for it. Yeah, 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 we are. There's a, so we, our team, we're looking into statistical parsing. That's one side. We're also looking into, like you said, um, an alternative. We're, using, we're trying to build a knowledge graph um, where we, we, we're trying to learn word meanings and relationship mappings, not by a parser, but by some, by some semantic graph. Um, so there are, there are different options, and it's, it's, it's a case of, Develop it, see how well it works. Uh, develop it, see how well it works, and choose which one is, you know, giving you the best results. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. No problem. More questions? Any other questions? At the moment, no, it's enterprise con it's 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 uh, it's an enterprise solution. So companies companies choose to either the companies who are using it, they choose who gets to interact with it. Um, so the the healthcare system, there it's only it's only people like doctors and nurses who have a login to the system. In in companies like SoftBank, it'll be Anyone who comes up to you know those that robot and uh, and ask question in in other deployments it's usually call center stuff so it's not uh, the, to my knowledge it's not yet open to anybody but I think that will change because there's we've got a we've got a lot we've got some new clients coming on and usually what they do is they they trial it with uh, internally, so they use their own core center stuff um, to interact with it, to refine it, to improve it, and when they're happy with it, they make it an option. So people can either call in, the core center staff use it, or people can go directly and ask what's in the question. I had, uh, I tried to prepare a Portuguese, uh, a Brazilian Portuguese demo. I didn't have time to train the models, so I asked a few questions last night, and some of the answers were really bad. Uh, so I just thought, no, let me just not, uh, because my boss might get upset with me if I show him a really bad system. Um, so there are different ways. 
to interact with the system. Yes? Uh, maybe a simple question. Um, in a system where efficiency really matters, like what's the, uh, why was the main language uh, chosen in Java? Um, That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess, um, I guess because of UEMA. So I said UEMA is the, is the, um, the architecture. Um, UEMA was developed for Java. So UEMA is basically a way to, to plug in Java components in runtime. So imagine you have an XML file, and each, each tag is a Java class. UEMA is a way to, to, to take an XML file and you can embed the, uh, different uh, delegate engines, they call it. And you can aggregate uh, different classes. And it's, I think it was just a way for flexibility, to have flexibility. Um, but once, once, once you also have a distributed system that's parallel, I don't know if it makes much of a difference, the native language, you know, C or, uh, or Java. Um, once you can, once you can parallel, parallelize your jobs, um, I think you have a fairly even base. Sure. All right, I guess, well, thank you for your attention.